Hello, uh, my name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image, and I welcome to you, you to this extremely special conversation that we're able to have um, with two fantastic filmmakers uh, who are here representing a film that uh, has just made its way to Netflix. It's had just a few days um, on air uh, or available for streaming. Uh, we're actually doing this interview right before it goes on air. So uh, by the time you see this conversation, you'll have an opportunity to see the film and we actually don't know what your responses are going to be, um, but I think they're gonna be positive um, and they'll probably be varied in terms of having a lot of different uh, feelings about what you've just seen. The film of course is Bob Ross, Happy Accidents, Betrayal and Greed. Um, and this is of course coming to you via Netflix. Um, I just wanna thank for this uh, opportunity to do this conversation. I wanna thank Netflix and Obscured Pictures for being amazing to put, uh, you know, put this together and make this film available and make this conversation available to our members at the museum. Um, this, of course, will be presented live, that you're seeing this live. It will also be uh, available via, via recording for the coming days. So hopefully as you catch up to this film, you'll also catch up to this conversation. And with that, I'd love to do a very quick introduction for our filmmakers. Um, uh, if you've been paying attention to documentary series in the last several years, and you're certainly familiar um, with their work for the Hulu series Sasquatch, as well as the Amazon series Lorena. Um, and now their brand new film uh, via Netflix is, of course, Bob Ross, Happy Accents, Betrayal and Greed. And we'd love to welcome the filmmaker and director, Joshua Rofe, and the producer, Steven Berger. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Hello. Um, for those who are, are, there's already stories and features being written about this film because there's a lot to dig into, but for those who are not familiar with, with any of the sort of story around this film, do you mind just letting us know exactly, you know, how you came to this project or how this project came to you? Yeah, I mean, Stephen and I had spoken a few years back about maybe making a documentary that examined uh, various American artists and their sort of relationship uh, with a, a given moment of strife in American history or, or a sort of loaded moment in American history. And one of the, one of the names that we talked about as a, for the 80s was actually Bob Ross. Um, obviously the 80s was, a, was a, loaded, uh, a loaded decade and we thought maybe looking at it through Bob's lens, whatever that was, we had no idea, it could be interesting. But it was really, uh, it wasn't something we were paying a ton of attention to. We picked up, you know, our sort of energy for it, you know, in the most minor of ways. And then we, we had a meeting with, uh, with the executive for Ben Falcone and Melissa McCarthy for their company. Her name's Divya D'Souza. And, it, you know, this is one of those meetings where your, your, uh, your manager sets you up with, a, 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 with somebody to meet with, and you're going to just essentially see if you vibe creatively. And usually you can have a, a, a meeting that's perfectly fine, but you're not going to walk out, you know, with a, a project that you want to do together. Um, that's very rare. But we were having this great meeting with Divya, and then she brought up Bob Ross, and she she brought up how much Ben and Melissa loved Bob Ross. And the two of us sort of perked up um, because we certainly, uh, you know, were fans, of course. And then she said something really interesting, which was that the Ben and Melissa had thought of maybe, maybe pursuing a scripted film of, about Bob, may, maybe writing one. And that when they started their initial research, there just wasn't much information online and certainly not enough to inform a, a screenplay about somebody's life. And so in that moment, we just sort of said, well, what if we, what if we made the doc? We, we, that's kind of what we do. We, we find things out that are not uh, just out there, you know, for the taking. Cut to a few weeks later, we sit down with Ben and Melissa, all of us together, and I know personally, it's one of my favorite meetings I've ever had because there was nothing show busy about it. For however long that meeting lasted, we were all just talking about Bob Ross. What moved us about him, the conversations we'd had with other people about him and all that sort of thing. And we, we really left that um, knowing that we were going to move forward in uh, an attempt to make a, a, a doc about Bob Ross, but not necessarily knowing what that would be. And then Stephen and I, we 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 went ahead with uh, with our team of people that we that we uh, work with, and we started to do what we do, which is just reach out to people who knew Bob, reach out to people who worked with him, and we came up again. We came up uh, on two things that were constants. One is everybody we spoke to loved Bob and missed him dearly, and the other was that they were afraid to speak on camera. Uh, they were afraid of some sort of legal retribution or retaliation from a corporate entity 
that they were afraid to name uh, in our initial conversations. And it was, it was in that moment that we knew that there is, there's for sure a story here that, that's even more compelling than, than we could have imagined. Um, and that was, that, that was really how it all started. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I can imagine, like, as you said, those, those two uh, realities that you came upon doing those interviews and, and getting in touch with people. And of course, you find out that people don't want to speak on camera, then you know there's a story there and you know you probably want to make the film. But then, of course, there's a challenge in making that film if not everybody wants to talk to you. Where does that tipping point happen? How do you actually know that you have enough to present in a documentary like this, even though you're getting that resistance? I mean, the, the, the truth is that we, we had an experience when making Sasquatch that was really interesting where we made Lorena and we interviewed 50 people. And then we made Sasquatch and everybody that we wanted to talk to was afraid for a very different reason. They were afraid because they sort of existed in the criminal underworld and there were you know, very real uh, concerns in, in terms of safety. Um, but when we were making that, we realized that there's actually something really special about having only a handful of people who are willing to tell a story. Um, and, you know, we learned that lesson and then of course forgot it because we all have amnesia. And so then we set out to make this film and we're coming up against this resistance and we think, oh wow, maybe we can't do this. And then you have, you know, an hour or so to metabolize that disappointment and you realize no this is exactly why we're making this movie uh -huh. and the, and and you know we need to press on and um so it it's a fine line between thinking you should stop because you're not going to be able to do it um and then realizing that in some cases like this one that's the very reason you you you, you press on and so i mean i would i would imagine a big part of what you're pressing on and then you realize you've got something here and you've got enough um, to, to sort of work with in terms of like first person accounts when you, you know, when you get um, the son of Bob Ross, right? When you have uh, Steve, right? Steve, um, yep. when you have Steve Ross uh, agree to participate, was that an early get? Was that a later get? Was that a difficult get? Because I've really, really done this before. Yeah, er early. Um, th that was early and that was really, um, that was for, that was definitely a turning point um, when you know that uh, you really have something. And so, can you just describe a little bit about those early conversations were with Stephen and why this was the moment that he was actually going to work with 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 filmmakers and 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 and, and really sort of he says a lot. You know, he's he's incredibly open with you, and so that I'm sure that was not an easy decision to make, and maybe he wouldn't have made with other filmmakers. Why do you think he worked with you? Stephen, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, and it, you know, it, obviously Steve has been very quiet for the last, you know, 25 plus years, but in, in talking to Steve, it was clear that he still had um, obviously such a profound love and sense of loss for his father. And um, it r really was clear that, um, you know, well, we set out to tell this story because Bob Ross was somebody who we all sort of grew up with and was in our living room. Um, and we all feel like we know him, but we don't know anything about him. Uh, this was still very much a, a father-son story to him uh, and one that hadn't been told and really deserved to be told. So I really think that, um, you know, our interactions or early conversations with him um, really sort of put Bob uh, in a whole new light and a whole new context for us. And um, as much as we didn't really get a sense of who he was, we certainly really didn't understand him as a father or family man other than seeing his son painting with him on the Joy of Painting, which... You know, I think everybody had an amazing reaction to at the time. And, you know, you can go on the Internet and, and see that people still do. But um, it really just breathed a whole nother dimension into the film. And, and one that um, I think just really uh, is strongly rooted in a lot of emotion and, and really grounds it as well. And so you, you described how like the, 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 this Bob Ross had come up earlier in, in, in a potential thing, you know, subject for, for documentary. I'm curious about what. You know, because there's if, if, if everything you learned just simply affirmed everything you already knew that may not have been as interesting to you. I'm curious about what you were finding, what you were discovering, talking to Stephen, talking to other folks and also just rewatching footage, et cetera. What was emerging to you that was sort of telling you new things about about Bob Ross? I mean, the film is, it's, of course, that but I'm wondering just what 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 started to emerge for you? I, I think that the sort of very clear picture of this, the, the sadness and the loss that was that was running through certain chunks of Bob's life. Um, and, and certainly, um, 
you know, the, the, the turmoil that, that had entered his, uh, his business relationship, which was one of the most uh, crucial components to, to his very existence, really, a, as an artist and as a person. Um, and so when, you know, when those things started to come up, that's, that's when, you, that's when you, you know, we leaned in even more. Um, and then we had, this, we had this really interesting experience where, um, and I, I want to give a lot of credit to two of our team members who watched literally every episode of The Joy of Painting, Caitlin Hines and Lucas Cox, who are, uh, who are co-producers on the film. Um, and, you know, first you're watching, when you don't know anything, you're watching these, these, uh, these episodes and they're very calming and you're very moved and charmed by Bob. Um, and then we would learn some more of what was really going on. And we would, we would see a clip from an episode that, that we knew because of the timeline fell somewhere in, uh, in that, in that chunk of time. Where, where Bob was, Bob was not happy, um, and and things things were not going right uh, for him, from his perspective in the uh, you know dynamic of his business relationship with his partners, and then all of a sudden a moment that you thought was Bob sort of imparting wisdom to the viewer was actually Bob being angry, mm-hmm. and it, it was it was Bob, he was still whispering, but he was he was screaming the only way he, he knew how to. Um, in, in terms of being able to sort of connect with the viewer. And so that, that was wild. Um, mm. it just to see, my God, he is so, he's so upset here. Um, and the things that he's saying are, they're supercharged, but in a Bob Ross way. Um, and that, that was fascinating. You have to know that footage really well and you have to know him really well to discern that whatsoever. Cause you're right. You wouldn't necessarily have gotten that if you were just seeing it fresh. Exactly. Um, which I think is really extraordinary to be able to take f- footage that's quite familiar to a lot of people. Like a lot of people watch Joy of Painting, a lot of people still watch the Joy of Painting, be able to see it anew um, is really quite something. I think you've allowed, you've, you've, you've provided that for that experience for folks. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, curious about uh, that, uh, the challenge, the, the filmmaking challenge in terms of how to, there's a lot of different masters you could be serving here. There's a lot of different storylines you could be serving uh, and, you, and you do, but you know, and there's also a lot of storytellers you need to be serving, a lot of points of view. And you kind of figure out, I, I think you, you, you make a really a lot, of, a lot of fantastic and very successful choices throughout, but I'm curious about what it was like to make those choices because you, know, you, um, you have archival of, of this footage of the, of the show as well as additional footage um, you have obviously interviews with folk you actually have stories that need to be told about people or to include people that are not going to participate you have uh, you have this era of american culture which i think emerges too you know you know the sort of element of public television which i think you also sort of tell that at there's a lot of things to, that to cover here how do you sort of balance that out in the edit and how do you sort of like what were your north stars in terms of exactly how to prioritize all these things at once I mean, our, our, our North Star was always emotion. Um, and um, emotion as it related to where Bob was in, in the story and, and where Steve Ross was in the story. But Bob being the primary um, focus. And, you know, fr- from there, it's just, it's so interesting making a documentary because you're essentially writing it in the editing room. And so it quite literally doesn't work until you're done. Um, and if you if you showed your first three or four cuts to an audience, they would have no idea what you're doing. They would wonder why you were even allowed to make this in the first place, and you shouldn't be calling yourself a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Like right. it's it's just it's sort of it's such it, it's such a it's I don't even want to say it's controlled chaos. It's just sort of it's chaos because you get lost in the forest, you know. Um, but along the way, you just you start to um, you start to figure out really all the sort of the, those signposts that you all mentioned that you just mentioned all those signposts mm-hmm. like we didn't we didn't have those in the beginning we mm-hmm. we found our way to, you know towards them um, and Alan Duso who is the editor of this is truly brilliant and did an amazing job but yeah it's just you just uh, I there's no magic it's just you just show up every day and you work. Um, and it, it, you know, eventually these things tell you, 
I'm, I'm a main piece, I'm a main piece, I'm a main piece. And once those emerge, I think you're so familiar with everything else that you have that through endless conversation, you can figure out what the connective tissue is. Um, but really it's, it, it, it's just, a, it, it's a war of attrition, I think, uh, when you're making a documentary. And you know, every, any doc filmmaker or editor or producer will tell you the same. Um, you just have to show up and keep doing it really. And one thing I'll just quickly add to that, and it, I guess, speaks a little bit to the previous question. Um, as we were making the film and revisiting certain pieces of archival that maybe we had seen, you know, half a dozen or a dozen times before, the more information that we got, <clears throat> the more context we had uh, about what was happening in Bob's life, um, we started to sort of make new little discoveries or little nuances that we wouldn't have picked up on before. Um, so the process sort of enlightened a lot of that emotional component that Josh was talking about, even a, a simple photo of Bob where he looks exhausted and you, you think, okay, he's probably been going from workshop to workshop for, you know, six months straight. And then, um, you know, I think everybody's seen the film at this point, um, you know, you, you start to understand, oh, this is when he's really deep in sickness and he's working himself to, you know, to the bone to, to leave a legacy. Um, and suddenly it's charged with this emotion that when you first saw it, or the, maybe you saw it five times, it just didn't possess that same sort of electricity of emotion that suddenly, you know, you drop it into a specific sequence and it, uh, it has a whole new life. There's, there's also, th which is I think remarkable for a film of feature length that you can sort of establish, use footage to establish something for, for one purpose say, and then actually call back to it later. And, and you're even teaching us how to look at things too, which is I think beautiful for a film about art and painting is that, and, and artists is that for, for one thing, there is the moment where he's sort of cleaning the brush you know, the sort of ritual that he does in terms of whacking the brush and sort of using the paint thinner um, that uh, is sort of like a, a, a beautiful gesture that those who watch the show are familiar with. And then you sort of call back to it later on to sort of say that it actually may have affected his health, you know. Um, and same thing when Stephen appears, like there's sort of the tension that sort of gets introduced over time. And you have a beautiful, an incredible montage where you see a lot of him towards the end where we sort of see how that, it's really more about his relationship with his father rather than him being a guest on a show. Um, and, and, and another thing that comes to mind is the way that, and, and forgive me, there uh, names have, have, have escaped me, but the, the um, contemporaries and somewhat competitors uh, to Bob, uh, who Bill Alexander, uh, John Bam, right? Um, how they're they're I, I love them as a voice in the film. Mm -hmm. I love the way that they speak about Bob. I love the way that they, um, but then we you don't quite understand that they're actually going to come in later on too, as some of the significant legal tensions come into it. Um, so just just as a work of construction, I think to sort of establish these things for like you're not necessarily using rest you know uh forcing footage to do just one thing you're allowing it to to exist in a couple different ways but do you mind just because i'm so interested in them and how they work talk a little bit about some of these other sort of figures that may not be as as essential as steve but actually sort of do get a chance to just i'm, I'm thinking about that uh, the, uh, those other artists i'm thinking as well as the director um of 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 the show who i think is wonderful a perspective throughout um and just you know how does how you decided to sort of populate the film with these other people steven you want to go ahead I, at the jenkins too um, yeah you know one thing i i will just quickly say is you know as josh was saying we were, we were looking at um you know a, a project about you know multiple sort of uh, artists and the interconnectedness i don't think this is necessarily the story we were um, expected to tell in terms of the interplay of, of these different artists. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot, you know, I think that's best left, you know, for, for the film. But um, again, you kind of have that, um, that instance where you can show something and it's, it's interesting. And when you go back and examine it later, um, you're looking at it through an entirely different context. And, um, you know, particularly speaking to, to the Jenkins, um, you know, think about the footage that we see early on of, of uh, the workshops and the classes with people who are taking such great joy in learning how to paint. And then all of a sudden we're cutting back and we're seeing footage of, uh, of people in these classes and there's a much more ominous sort of tone. Um, and it, it does a lot of the heavy lifting um, where everything that you've heard is informing that image that you're seeing. Um, and and there's, there's so much to be inferred from that. I think there's just such great power in that. Mm -hmm. 
is there is there i always think this uh, those who make film with a fair amount of archival there's there can be a real um desire to just really dwell on the archival and make the film fully not, you know I've got, there are some films that are fully archival but i don't mean necessarily like in that strict sense but there's so much there to mine um you know those sort of a uh, sort of series of questions i have about sort of balance would you say like you know as, as you said joshua like it, not until the very end that you actually strike that balance but you know how are you sort of navigating that the potential desire they may have had to just sort of spend, spend even more time in the archival? Because I think you balance it well, but how did you arrive there? Yeah, you know, with this one, it's interesting. Believe it or not, we didn't have that much archival. If you if you remove the joy of painting episodes, uh, you know, from the sort of pie chart of archival, we, we actually didn't have that much. Um, and so this, this was one where I, I felt like we used every every meaningful bit that we had mm -hmm. um but you know the flip side of that is you know with the joy of painting episodes you could definitely overuse them and you could you could overdo it um and the second you overdo it it'll then lose its power um and so i i think for i think for for, for us in making this film specifically we really we wanted the archival to you know to to of course place you in the time and space um but then even more so uh, punctuate certain moments. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think the opportunity to, to, to do that came from what both you and Steven were, were referencing with, you know, you see something early and then you see it again later. Um, mm -hmm. And it becomes punctuation later. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was just, just trying, trying, to, trying to use what we had in, in the most sort of economical, um, uh, in, you know, deployment, um, all, again, all, always in the name of emotion. And by having such a, a well-known beloved show, you don't have the pressure to represent that show in some significant time elapsed way, right? Yeah, like, that's true. Where if, if, if it was a rare thing for us to actually look at footage like this, then maybe you'd feel the need to provide more than, than there is there. So you, you can sort of rely on our familiarity to some degree. No, that's very true. That's and, true. and the truth of the matter is that there is very little sort of behind the scenes as you'd expect it uh, that exists of that. I mean, I don't think PBS is known for their massive uh, EPK or whatever the equivalent of the time would be of, of uh, those sorts of looks. And <clears throat> I, I, this didn't make it into the film, but I remember Dana Jester talking about how if he really understood <clears throat> the the gravity of the time and how important it would be, he would have never stopped taking pictures. And that was a big regret for, for him in particular. Uh, and the other thing, I, I think the sort of like the, probably the biggest challenge I would imagine in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of the, the composition of this, the balance of this um, would be the balancing Bob's story in life versus Bob's story in death or the story around what happened uh, with his death and, 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 and after. Um, and and how did you manage that balance? Because it, it, it really does shift. There's a real shift in consequences, a shift in tone, there's a shift in like how we look at some of these characters. I mean, the truth is it's, uh, you know, usually, a, usually let's just categorize this for a second as sort of a biopic uh, documentary. Usually those are pretty close to the end when, when, when the person dies, right? If, if they haven't in fact passed. Um, that obviously that was not the case here because the 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 fallout and everything that, that that happened after Bob died is in many ways the reason we were probably all making the film in the first place. Um, it it because all of it is just a continuation of you know the the end of Bob's life that the, the you know what he was embroiled in um, as he he is dying from cancer he is literally in hospice. And he's having these incredibly difficult business conversations, um, and and so I I think that you still you still feel you know hopefully you you feel the emotional fallout from that even after he, he even after he he dies um, you know in the film um, and his own story uh, ended uh, but then really that the emotional fallout from that. It then it's it spills over into you know courtroom depositions and 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 legal battles and just um, 
things that people who loved him can't seem to make sense of or make peace with. Um, and so in many ways, it was representative, I think, uh, structurally of, of the way it really went down. It was, there was this amazing time with Bob and, and, and it also was infused with you know, a, a good deal of tragedy. And then for this last chunk of years, just like this last chunk of the film, there's, there's everything that came after. Uh, sort of as that was unresolved, you know, when he died. Um, but uh, but it's it, it's it's tricky to know when to when to sort of start and stop those things. Um, but uh, you know, we just you, we just had to trust our our guts and and, and go with what we felt uh, you know worked. And there could be like from a from a kind of cleaner storytelling uh, uh, point of view you could feel like you need to seed that earlier. You need to have the first half of the film for it somehow infused with that, which I think you, you don't really do, but like I can imagine that that may have been a note that may have been a desire at some point in order to sort of reach that ending point. His whole life would have to be colored by what happened after. Right. I mean, we definitely, we wanted to tease up top that there was something coming around the bend. Um, we thought that was, we thought that was really important. Um, mm -hmm. We thought that that was really an honest way to experience all of the lighter stuff, because sure. even as he was experiencing the lighter stuff, um, you know, with the, with the, with with the fans, with, with with the audience, these other things were going on, um, and so, you know, te teasing that up front, uh, we felt that you you will forget about it at times. You will forget sure. that, that there is some darkness coming, and then you'll and then you'll remember. Um, <clears throat> And I think it just makes you sit up, you know, probably a little bit straighter, um, you know, as, as, as you're watching. Um, sure. Yeah. No, I, I think I think you handle. I mean, I personally think you handle it really well by teasing that, but then at the same time, not having the weight of that sort of inform the sort of like the sort of lighter, the sort of joyous aspects of the life that 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 you're navigating. Because for me, like you talk about the emotion as as being a priority throughout here, um, the emotion of all of a sudden this life, this story sort of devolving into legal battles and kind of backbiting and all that stuff. It just, it sinks in your chest. You know, of course I, I'm, I'm, I'm cluing in. I'm, I want to understand it. I want to understand what's happening legally. I want to understand who's doing what to whom, but there's, there, there's a motion of just kind of real sadness and disappointment that this is where things have led knowing sort of a sort of lightness that he was, he had brought to the world before that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's uh People can get so caught up. I mean, we hear about these legal battles with uh, the estates of uh, uh, of celebrities and icons who, who have uh, who have passed away, and there's there's nothing human attached to it. Generally, you know, you it just sounds like people fighting over money, um, and so we we wanted to paint a picture that that again was sort of grounded in humanity um, and, and and loss uh, really. Um, because that 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 is what, what what's at the heart of this, but uh, yeah. but but I think you know to your point, there's still there's so much there's so much joy on that sort of roller coaster uh, of his upswing in the early years, and I I, I you know I th I think I think people can still get lost in that because there were there were great times you know there were great times I mean he he was ha he was happy a lot you know he had a lot of great days. Um, and the people around him were were were, were happy uh, and, and had great days with him. Um, but uh, yeah, my my, my got to say, my the, the thing that was most revelatory to me, and, and and maybe I'm just a simpleton, but it was revelatory to me um, how the his his vocal strategy was one of seduction. Um, I, I it, it's brilliant, you know, because it's obviously it's calibrated for a certain audience and a certain time for a certain station. It's not overplayed. It was easily parodied, but I actually think like talk about a stealth successful technique because it completely achieved what he wanted it to achieve without it being obvious. That's what he was doing. Yeah. And I, I got to say, talk about a guy who was so ahead of his time. I mean, now <clears throat> obviously the three of us are uh, talking via Zoom and everybody is on Instagram Live and Snapchat and TikTok and all these sorts of things. We're all broadcasting to the world and there is an inherent lack of intimacy in that, right? But he understood at a time where that was not a concept we're all familiar with about that sort of human and personal connection. Uh, and that's how you can actually reach people. And um, I think that was sort of a clairvoyant gift that was uniquely possessed by Bob. And 
it's one of the things as we have this sort of um, uh, disconnected uh, sort of world that we live in uh, that he's still so impactful. He's still connecting with people through screens um, be because of his approach that, uh, you know, few people today really, really have that ability. I think few people, honestly, in the history of broadcast media have really quite understood that that television can be an intimacy machine. And, and there is a way of actually just connecting one-to-one -one with people. And there is just a handful of people, I think, who are kind of titans who have, have done that very thing. Um, they think of it as being an opportunity for spectacles, an opportunity for, for entertainment with a capital E, but then there are others who just get that. Yeah, and in talking about, you know, the, the time we spend in the film, you know, post Bob's life, it, it, there's a lot to be said about the number of lives who Bob has touched since he passed away. And you know, at the end of the film, we have Justin and we have Katie. And you know, these are two people whose, whose lives have been, you know, completely um, turned 180 because they found Bob Ross and, and everything that he brought to them. And, and um, you know, and they're two of many stories um, uh, in the last 25 or so years since Bob's passed. Um, that, that connection is, a, is an undeniable one. Yeah. Um, it, it, obviously, you, you handle this however you want to. I'm sure you've been asked versions of this, but I'd love to sort of know a little bit about the, the sort of behind the scenes connections with Rob Ross, Inc. and uh, the degree to which, you know, attempts were made to have conversations with them. You know, like like what, what your understanding was going along about whether the likelihood that they would participate and also how you might want to approach telling that aspect of the story. Yeah, I mean, we, we reached out to, to Bob Ross um, Inc. very early on um, and let them know uh, what we were embarking on. And we very swiftly back, uh, you know, got an email, you know, stating in no uncertain terms that they own all copyrights and uh, we have lawyers, we intend to use them and tread lightly. Um, <clears throat> and we, you know, continued on our, our path telling a story about a, a public figure, you know, and, and um, telling that story with, with his son about his relationship with his father. Um, and then, you know, as we sort of, sort of were able to peel back more onion, uh, layers of the onion of the story and really had more information, we got to a point where, you know, it's only fair to give them the opportunity to, to respond uh, to, to these sorts of things that have come up. And so, um, again, we, we reached back out again. Um, we were shut down once again. And sort of in the, the 25th hour towards the end of the film, they decided that they wanted to um, sort of respond to, to um, a, a couple of things. But... You know, this this film was made by the people who were close were made in conjunction with the people who are closest to Bob and were with him to the end um, that that was extended to uh, Bob Ross Inc and those who run it and um, they sort of chose not to uh, participate to the fullest extent right and then how do you feel about where the film lands and how it sort of is going to be part of this ongoing conversation. Obviously, there's a legal battle that is documented in the film that uh, seems to sort of have concluded itself and, and is, is, is expressed as such in part of your narrative, but obviously the narrative will continue in a sense. And I'm curious about how you feel about, and, and I think uh, I, I would imagine you're not fully reluctant to participate in that because the film does sort of have a point of view of sorts. So I'm just curious, like how you're feeling about how it's going to enter into the culture now um, as it pertains to those issues. Yeah, I'll just quickly say that, you know, the, the film isn't here to, to relitigate what's already played out in the U.S. court system. And um, th that's all well established. And we're, we're not even looking to open that conversation back up. Um, but there is a, a question of what's right and wrong and what Bob wanted. Um, and, you know, I think watching the film, it's, it's very clear what Bob's hopes and wishes were. Um, you know, it's clear given, um, you know, the way his son was was treated um, after Bob's death and the sort of position he was put in that um, that his his wishes weren't honored and um, I think that there's a sort of uh, question of morality associated with that um, but we're we're not here to sort of contest or provide any sort of opinion on um, what what's played out in the court system. Mm -hmm. But but I but you know at the same time there's something that then transcends all of that which is the way people feel about Bob. Um, and, and I think that's, that's ultimately, um, I think, you know, really the note that we end on and, and the, the, you know, the, the final sort of significant sentiment that we, that we leave the viewer with, which is but what made Bob special, Bob's magic, the thing that made him an icon, um, the thing that is the reason we all know his name, 
that is still out there doing its thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it is now it's just affecting new generations. And uh, really thanks to, you know, all, all the new technologies that, and, and, and the apps and platforms that continue to pop up, uh, Bob continues to get pushed out to people and they continue to, to want to receive him. And so what that sort of, that unnameable thing that makes him amazing um, is, uh, is really transcending all of the darkness that, that uh, you know, that is associated with this story in any way. I think that's an ideal place to leave the conversation, but I, I do wanna know if in the process, either of you were able to obtain a Bob Ross painting. Cause I know that's sort of part of the genesis of this story is that a lot of people do want to have a Bob Ross painting. Is that something you've been able to sort of pull off for yourselves? <laughs> no, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to start making uh, movies that have explosions in them uh, to be able to afford one. Yeah, we're, we're just doc filmmakers. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, thank you both so much for taking time to do Thank this. you so much. Thanks so much. Yeah. And good luck with everything. Thanks, you too.